Hello, and thank you for listening to Literacy Matters. I'm your host, Cheryl Lundy-Swift, and today I'm excited to be here with Lily Howard Scott, who is a social emotional learning coach and literacy consultant. Welcome to the show, Lily. It's wonderful to be here, Cheryl. I have so enjoyed getting to know you and learning more about uh, all that you do. I know that you're working on a book about shared classroom language and that you're teaching a class at Bank Street about this topic in the fall. I'm super excited to talk to you about it. Could you tell me about your interest in language? Absolutely. Um, well, I think any any teacher you meet will will tell you that that hopefully their words matter, right? Um, but I think what is surprising is that recent research reveals that our words really, really matter. You know, that language is not so much separate from thought, but a part of thought. So what we say, what we hear trigger, you know, new neural pathways that lead to brand new patterns of thinking. Um, for instance, let's say a kiddo makes a mistake. A teacher might respond by saying, that's incorrect, try again. Uh, or the teacher can say, oh, what a brilliant mistake. And that second phrase, that unusual pairing of brilliant and mistake, uh, the kid internalizes as self-talk once the kid has heard it enough. And then in that moment, uh, sort of addresses that mistake with a sense of self-compassion and curiosity. Like, oh my God, my teacher always says that, that mistakes lead to the most meaningful learning, you know, where can this mistake lead me as opposed to shutting down um, and experiencing shame? Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say, the, the thing that I find most astonishing about language isn't so much that it, it lets us express what's within, though thank goodness it does, uh, but that it really transforms uh, what's within. You know, what we say informs how we think, how we behave, and teachers can share these little nuggets with kids that are really brain altering. And um, in my experience can transform how kids feel at school, which transforms how they do at school. Ooh, I love that. Transforms how they feel, which transforms how they do. I love those kind of examples that you provided, like the think, you know, that's a brilliant mistake. Are there other like kind of bite-sized examples that yeah. teachers can possibly use um, when to adjust the language that they're currently using? Yeah. Um, well, you know, and Cheryl, we've talked a little bit about this. Teachers, and, and and I speak for myself, nobody wants something prescriptive. Nobody wants a script, you know, say this on day one. Teachers, like kids, have different priorities and different interests. And so when it comes to these language nuggets, what I found helpful is really letting the teacher take the lead. So I like to give them, um, you know, four or five buckets. Um, the buckets that that usually tend to tend to resonate with teachers are, you know, establish and maintain a connected classroom community, an inclusive classroom community. If that's a priority of the teachers, I'll introduce some language nuggets within that bucket. Another bucket is uh, cultivating students' emotional literacy. Another one is supporting students when they really struggle, socially, emotionally, academically. And another bucket might be inspiring kids to strive for academic excellence, to not shut down when the going gets tough. So before I share a language nugget example, I guess to model this, is there a bucket there that's most interesting to you or, you know, that that you'd like to dig into? Sure. I think I think there are two that I'd love to to focus on if that's okay. Yeah. I'd love for you to talk more about kind of the social emotional piece, really, because that's obviously that's one of your wheelhouses. And yeah. then I'd love for you to talk about that kind of persevering the the academic piece as well. If you yeah. give me some examples for both of those, that'd be great. Yeah. So so that second one, cultivating students' emotional literacy. Um that that's one that teachers really are interested in. Uh Susan David wrote a book a few years ago called Emotional Granularity. And it's our or I'm so sorry, it's called Emotional Agility, but it's about emotional granularity, which basically means individuals who have a really wide emotional vocabulary have greater psychosocial well-being, uh, can self-regulate in a more positive way, just move through the world uh, with more kindness, uh, with more openness. They can sort of name it to tame it, if you will. And that phrase comes from Dr. Dan Siegel. Mm -hmm. So under that umbrella of helping cultivate kids' emotional vocabularies, um, I like to say one, one language nugget that's been pretty powerful is this one. You simply say to a kid, hey, 
you are separate from your feeling. Did you know you are not your feeling? I actually like to um, steal a little something from Rumi's poem, The Guest House. Like this being human is a guest house every day, a new arrival. Um, I like to say our feelings are visitors. They come and, they're, and they go. So right now you've thrown over the table, you know, and you've yelled really loudly and you've thrown the stapler. But, um, you know, I just want you to know that you are not your anger. What can we do to help calm down in this moment? So just for instance, that, that little snippet, you are separate from your feeling is a really powerful starting choice for uh, starting place for teachers as they navigate kids who are struggling. Then a teacher might say, um, and this is inspired by Dr. Becky Kennedy's work, a teacher might say, you are always good inside even when you are not making a good choice. The teacher might continue with a nugget like, all right, what can your best self? Some teachers like wisest self. Some teachers like core self. A third grade student of mine called this, this inner voice, her wisest, kindest voice, her president decider. She said, this is the, the voice that gets to choose what to say to all the other voices. So a teacher might say, what can your wisest self say back to that feeling of anger right now? You know, just because you think something or feel something doesn't always make it true, yeah. which is a pretty radical idea, right? That we don't have to um, sort of listen to every daily visitor, that we get to be the CEO of our own brains. Those are some nuggets which can um, let teachers maintain the dignity of students when students are struggling and let kids, um, you know, sort of turn the mirror on themselves, use this language, right? What would my core self say? Or I am separate from my feeling, really helping kids learn to positively manage their inner lives. What a powerful gift to give students to be able to, one, identify that they, they're separate from their emotional response, but also their emotion in general. I think that's really an important thing. It's super powerful. I really appreciate that so much and can imagine some of my students who could have benefited from that language uh, for sure. I, I really appreciate that. What if, what if there's a child who doesn't really understand that they're not their emotion? That's, I mean, there are many grownups who don't understand. I mean, I, I'm still struggling with this. Right? Well, we, we all, we all are wrestling with this all the time. I think, um, a powerful place to start is maybe take a little distance from the student and weave this into your literacy work. Because another Im important thing I want to emphasize is that all of these bite-sized phrases, they are woven right into your curriculum. It's not like you have a 30 minute kind of, you know, SEL time of the day. All this work is woven into whatever it is you're doing. So the teacher, if there's a kid who's really struggling to understand that, uh, he is separate from his feeling. The teacher in the context of a read aloud might in a moment of high emotional tension say, it's interesting, this character is about to make this choice. What feeling do you think is really visiting this character at this moment? Now, how could we coach this character to make a good choice if you were the character's wisest self? You know, whatever language you decide on as a class. I think it's important that teachers choose language that resonates with them. If you were the language, if you were this character's core self, if you were this character's president decider, raise a hand. What would you say back to that, to that feeling of anger or that feeling of pressure? So then the kid is practicing it from a distance. The kid is really improving his reading comprehension. That's certainly beyond the text thinking. That's really... Um, I would argue, in, important literacy work. And then it's a little easier to try it yourself later on in the day if you've practiced in this safe way. Sure, I love that. Now, when I think about teachers coming in brand new uh, or novice or seasoned teachers, and you're talking about this really awesome language to incorporate, it may feel like one more thing. How can they begin to adjust their language? right? Oh, I have to learn a whole new language now, right? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> so uh, I think the best, um, for, you know, 
I was a third grade teacher for many years. I was really tired. It was the best job I've ever had and the hardest job I've ever had. I'm with you. Nobody has the energy to throw out what they're doing and adopt something totally new. And, and nor should they, because I'm sure a lot of what teachers are doing in terms of their language is beautiful work and works for them. So the crux of this work is that micro decisions matter, that these tiny adjustments in the way that we speak can have a powerful, powerful impact. And this is rooted in, in neuroscience. So Dr. Bruce Perry, who, um, are you familiar with the book, What Happened to You? It's that yeah. best-selling book that he wrote with the one and only Oprah. Yeah. There's this line I always think about. He writes, uh, the most powerful and enduring human interactions are often very brief. And that change is not a product of like a 45 minute heart to heart with a student. It's this steady accumulation of like very brief connected moments and the language you use in those moments can really initiate a tectonic shift. And so, you know, maybe the teacher just adopts like one new nugget a week or um, depending on what's happening with her students, uh, she may, you know, look in, in the book that I'm writing, she could look uh, in a different category. Like maybe there's a child who's really struggling academically. She'll look there and, and try to say something like, um, all right, instead of saying, all right, I'm going to count to five and I need to see your pencil on the paper. I know you can do it. She might say, you know, different things are hard for different people. You have so many strengths. She'll list a few. Can you tell me what is hard for you in this particular moment about getting started with your writing? Then I can help you better. That question, what is hard about this for you, unlocks the door. Maybe the kid says, you know, I don't know how to write this letter. Or my brother told me earlier this morning, I'm not a writer. Or I just can't think of any ideas. Then the, the teacher has a really meaningful place to start. That language nugget unlocks all sorts of possibilities as opposed to the seemingly supportive nugget of, I know you can do it, get started. If you don't get started by this point, you know, by this time, there'll be, who knows, a logical consequence, whatever, that um, just that subtle change in language can be, can be really powerful. What about those teachers who feel overwhelmed by the curriculum and, and are having a hard time seeing their students? What, what can they do? Why, there, there's a lot of pressure. What can they do to kind of in, use, use some of the strategies that you're mentioning for even themselves? Oh man, I mean, that's the question of this moment, right? Their teachers feel so much pressure to cover curriculum, yeah, to meet these metrics. And, um, you know, Jerry Mueller wrote this book, The Tyranny of Metrics, and he writes, much that is important cannot be measured, and much that is unimportant can be measured. And in, you know, the pressure teachers feel to cover, to make sure that kids are achieving in a way that meets a particular metric, a metric that might be flawed anyway, often they feel like they don't have the time to teach the kid and not the curriculum. Right. I think the first thing I'd say is that teaching the curriculum and not the kid simply doesn't work, right? Like it just doesn't work. So if you're rushing through trying to cover, if you're not meeting kids where they are, behavior will begin to unravel. Kids will get, you know, they'll become unengaged. You'll find yourself leaning into a more authoritarian stance you'll engage in those power struggles. Even the kids who look like they're listening, they're sitting quietly. Who knows? As a kid said, uh, I love this quote, a child said, oh, I look like I'm listening, but I go into the rowboat in my head and I row away to a more interesting place. <laughs> so, this may sound anarchic, but I would say to the teacher, is covering the curriculum at all costs, is that even working? You know, is that even serving anybody? Right. Um, and then I might say, close your door and know that you will be able to help kids take the risks that lead to the most meaningful cognitive growth if they feel seen, known, valued by you, if you empower them with strategies to navigate their inner life. I mean, you empower a kid with little bits of language, like what a brilliant mistake. That kid can persevere through a difficult math assessment with a lot more gusto than a kid who feels really nervous about making mistakes, uh, about making mistakes. That's sort of paradoxically leaning into this work. It, it might feel soft or fluffy, but it actually lays the foundation for academic achievement, for risk-taking in the classroom. 
that will help your kids achieve more highly than if you didn't tend to it, if you didn't build that foundation and you just uh, tried to cover. And I, I want to say I am in no way teacher blaming here, that if teachers are just trying to cover, it's because they feel a pressure to do so. Right. Or in some cases, it's tethered to a bonus. I absolutely understand that desire. And I think, I don't know wh what the solution is, Cheryl, but we've got to somehow decrease that pressure and let teachers be treated like professionals, you know, really have the autonomy to make their own choices in the classroom and respond to kids in flexible ways. Since you're also a literacy coach, how does that apply for children who are really struggling to read? Yeah. Okay. So that's such a great question. Um, one little bit of language that I uh, have found to be most successful with teachers and students who are struggling is this little two word snippet. Um, and that two word snippet, uh, it's been around for a long time. It's the idea of both and. So you might say to a kid who's really struggling to read, maybe you've introduced both and language in the context of a read aloud. You might say, wow, it is both true that you are a gifted reader thinker. Your insights during read alouds are so perceptive. And it is also true that you're struggling with decoding right now. That's your area for growth. So here's what you've just done for the kid. You've let her know or him know that, that two seemingly opposite truths exist at once. It is both true. You have all these strengths as a reader and you have this area for growth because what does that six-year-old want to do? Think in black and white. I'm not a reader. This isn't for me. If it was for me, I'd be able to do it. I'd be on the same book as my classmate over there. That's six levels ahead. So then you're giving the kid the self-talk. Yep, two things are true. Both this is true and that is true. And that's a really deeply comforting little nugget to sort of keep the child company as she navigates something that's hard. Another language nugget that does that is just because mm doesn't mean, mm. you know, just because I'm having a hard time with this right now doesn't mean that it won't feel a lot better tomorrow. That having access to these phrases, um, you give kids really immediate ways to, to shape words around a feeling that might feel really amorphous, like a feeling that's curdling, a feeling or a, a swirling within that might lead that kid to just slam her pencil down, walk out of the room, or as I've seen before, just get under the table during writing time. Yeah. Yeah. So, and how do you help a child when it's literacy time? It's time for that small group reading um, and they just hate it. They just feel like they can't, that they've not had success. They're a fifth grader now and they still don't feel confident with reading. Um, how do, how, what kind of language can a teacher use yeah. to help them in that space where they just don't feel like they can? Yeah, I think I would return... Um, there is a wonderful book called The Art of Possibility. And I learned about this book from Dr. Gravity Goldberg, a colleague of mine. And there's some language in there I found so helpful when a kid is doing something the kid just hates to do uh, or feels like this, you know, this isn't my thing. And the language is contribution. Well, it's contribution mindset, we could call it. So I might say something like this in that small group setting. We all contribute to our learning here in different ways. I want you to have a contribution mindset. A contribution mindset means that I'm actually not only interested in you reading the word correctly. I'm not in only interested in you answering the question in a way that might you know, immediately fall within the box that you think the right answer falls in. Mm. Whatever your contribution is, maybe it's a connection, maybe it's a mistake, maybe it's wondering maybe it's a wondering, you're going to take our learning here to unexpected and joyful places. So I want you to remember your contribution mindset um, and try not to feel too nervous about showing up for our reading group today, because whatever you contribute is really going to lead us somewhere interesting. I'm really not interested in right or wrong in this particular moment. So that takes the pressure off of that child who might feel uh, really nervous about failing in front of her peers. Maybe she, maybe her contribution is a connection, an idea, a wondering, a mistake, 
that leads the whole group to a more interesting place. Sure. I, I love the idea of a contribution mindset because it, it moves kids away from, is it right or is it wrong? Um, as the authors say, um, it moves kids away from the idea, am I loved for who I am or for what I can achieve and moves them towards the idea of how will I be a contribution today? And I can be a contribution in all sorts of unexpected ways. Sure, sure. That's, that's, I mean, again, there, there's, there's, there's nothing like having a community, a safe space where you feel like you do add something no matter where you are in terms of you, you know, what, what you can do now, right? Because we know yes. there's, one word I love um, that I think is really super powerful is, and that's yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another little net language nugget, you know. Oh, Not yeah. yet, but but you will. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we know that these words are super powerful, so powerful that you mentioned that it changes your brain. Can you tell me a little bit more about how it does that? Yeah. These um, these little nuggets of language basically keep us company all day, and whether or not we realize it. If we pay attention to the cacophony within any of our brains, we're speaking to ourselves all day long. So all that this does is as kids say to themselves, you know, as self-talk, oh, it's okay. Mistakes help my brain grow. Or no, you know, I made a bad choice, but that doesn't mean I'm bad. I'm always good inside. My teacher tells me that. Or, hmm, okay, what can my core self say back to that feeling of pressure right now? Oh, my core self can say, it's all right. It's good for you to play too. You don't always have to do your challenge work. That as we say that to ourselves, we think something new. We move from a dysregulated, anxious place to a place that feels calmer, which then makes our brains more available to learn. Sure, I love that. So as we close, I, I would love for you, um, especially since we're we're headed back to school, some of us are already in schools now, I'd love for you to share how this could support a brand new teacher. So think about a teacher who is overwhelmed with, oh my God, am I going to do this thing right? I know for me, I thought I was, my first year of teaching, I'm going to break them. <laughs> I'm going to do something to break these kids. And uh, so tell me what you would say to a brand new teacher um, to support them in building this kind of language and community in their classroom? Thank you for that question. Um, I want to start by emphasizing, as we spoke about earlier, that tiny choices really matter. And then I might guide that teacher towards that first bucket, you know, establishing and maintaining a connected, inclusive classroom community. Because language that does that, language like just saying to the kids on the first day of school, hey, I am here to teach you, not the curriculum. And everything you bring to our classroom community matters. Let's go around in a circle. I'm going to jot it down. Let's say we've got second graders. Something I bring to this classroom community is, what is it? Is it a, an idiosyncrasy, a hope, like a special silly talent? Getting kids, you know, using this language, what you bring matters, getting kids saying over and over something I bring is, mm. um, I love the feedback protocol, I admire, I notice, I wonder, getting kids using that language with one another, helping kids feel safe, connected, included. If you can do that, Cheryl, I think you've done you know, 90% of your work as a teacher, because that feeling, oh yeah, what I bring is worthy. What I bring matters. I feel known and valued for who I am, not for really how I achieve uh, in a very specific compliance oriented way. All of that beautiful stuff surrounding community, um, that's the key to inspiring kids to take those risks we talked about that lead to the most meaningful learning. And ironically, Sometimes community is the place where teachers might feel like they can brush over it in the name of academic achievement. So I would say to that teacher, stay in that place of cultivating community, lean into these, you know, six or seven language nuggets and correlating curricular extensions that let the kids feel um, known, seen, valued, and then you will have started your year in a really powerful place. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I really am looking forward to your book um, on this shared language. Um, I know it's going to make a difference for many teachers and students alike. Mm -hmm.